It has been an incredible journey through the book of 1 Timothy. Today we conclude that journey as we consider Paul's closing words to his pastoral apprentice in Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 17, Paul says this. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. This is God's word. Please pray with me. Father, we come eager to hear you speak, Lord, and we thank you that you are a God who speaks, a God who has made himself known unto his people through your living word. And we pray now, Father, for Pastor Trent as he comes to preach your word with great boldness, speaking both truth and grace, that you would speak through him to our very hearts, Lord, the depths of our being and our souls that that we might examine our own lives by the very words of God, that you might bring genuine change and transformation, that we might be renewed and restored and made whole in Christ, and that we might go from this place proclaiming the glories of Christ forevermore. May it be so by the good work of your spirit in our midst, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. As Pastor Todd shared, we are coming to the end of our series in 1 Timothy 20 weeks later, and uh, we've covered a ton of ground. I thought I would try to go back and summarize some of where we've been, and I thought, I I can't do that. There's just too much. So you can go back and watch them online if you'd like. Uh, We have uh, printed copies available if you'd like to go back, and of course, you can just simply open your Bible and read back through 1 Timothy, which might be a great practice here at the end of this series. But Paul closes this letter with a final instruction to the wealthy, the rich Christians in the congregation. And he does this because it may be that, given what he said the last couple of weeks that we saw, that the wealthy might think that they don't have a place in God's household. There might be something wrong with being rich or that, that you can't be rich and also be a Christian. And so Paul gives some final instructions for the rich about what it means to be a rich Christian. So what I want you to hear today is that what we saw a couple of weeks ago when Paul warned against uh, people who are loving money and he warned, against, uh, warned those who were desiring to be rich not to do so because by doing so you fall into temptation and into a snare. When he was saying those things, uh, that's not necessarily the rich who are doing that. It's not necessarily the rich who are greedy. It's not necessarily the poor who are generous. You can be broke and greedy. You can be rich and generous. Likewise, the opposite is also true. You can be poor and generous. You can be rich and greedy. What Paul is talking about is not whether you have much or you have little. He's talking about the heart. 
And he's asking the question, he's ask, causing us to ask the question, where do I stand with regard to money and possessions and wealth and how much do they have a grip on me? He does give these instructions though to rich Christians specifically because there are some real challenges that are accompanied with wealth. Remember the story of Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler. Here was a man who was described in the Bible as having great possessions. He comes to Jesus and he says to him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you know the commandments, here's some of them, do these things. And this rich young man says, oh, I have. I've kept all of them from my youth, actually. And then Jesus says to him these words, you lack one thing, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So here was a rich young man who had great possessions and they were so great that when Jesus asked him, let them all go and come and follow me. He couldn't do it. He chose his riches. He chose the world ultimately over Jesus. You know, that's still possible to do. We can still fall into that. And by the way, while this young man was rich, he wasn't anything rich like you or I. This young man couldn't go over to a tap in his kitchen and turn it on and get clean drinking water. He couldn't walk into a shower and turn it to hot and enjoy hot water. He didn't have anything near like the quality of the clothes that you or I are wearing. Certainly not the quantity of clothes or shoes that we take for granted each day. He didn't have anything like the educational opportunities that most of us have had access to. Of course, he couldn't travel the world at a whim like you and I can. And he didn't, couldn't take vacations like you or me. He certainly didn't have access to the kind of vision and dental and health care that most of us have access to. He didn't have any of these things, but, you know, for his own time, he was rich. Now, if this man, who was diligent to keep the commandments, could be kept out of the kingdom of God because of his tight grip on his possessions, which were far inferior to you and I, Perhaps we ought to sit up and take notice to what the Apostle Paul says here to rich Christians. It may not apply to just a few of us. It may be that what Paul is saying applies to all of us. In fact, I think that's exactly what it means. So what we're going to see this morning are things rich Christians must not do. And then we're going to look at the things rich Christians must do. And then finally, we're going to look at something that all of us as Christians need to do. So let's start with what rich Christians are not to do. First of all, rich Christians are not to be haughty. Do not be haughty, he says. Look with me in verse 17. He says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. Don't be arrogant. Uh, don't, don't be prideful. Don't start to think that you're better than other people because of the wealth that you possess. And the reason why he says this is because it's a real temptation that wealth brings. And that's not just wealth, that's relative wealth. If you're a pauper who has $100, it's quite possible for you to look down on the pauper next to you who only has 50. You see, this is, this is all across the board. Those of us who have more need to be careful that we don't become haughty and look down on those who have less wherever they may be or however we might be in relation to them. And I'll tell you this, that there are many aspects of our society that are almost seemingly designed to make you haughty if you have more than others. Take, for example, the airport experience. <laughs> if you have money or you're wealthy, at least in airline miles, while all the other poor folks are sitting out in the overcrowded gate on seats with pop stains on them and so on, you get to sit in the comfort of the Sky Lounge with access to a real buffet <laughs> and fast internet. 
And when it comes time for you to board your plane while all the other poor folks are lined up like cattle 100 miles long, you get to board first. And not only do you get to board first, but they have a special rug that's red right next to the one that's blue. And you get to walk on that one. And I assure you, if you are not have the right ticket and you walk down the red one, you have to go back on the blue one because that's not for you. And after you go on and you take your seat at the front of the plane and they serve you your complimentary beverage and your newspaper, you get to sit there and sip your drinks while you watch all the other poor schmoes make their way to the back of the plane. <laughs> and thankfully, once they get back there, this, the attendant closes the curtain so you don't have to see them again, <laughs> ever. Right? This is, you, what effect does that have on a person's psyche who's experienced that on a regular basis? The effect of that is if you're not careful, you might start to think you actually are worth more than the people who are sitting in the back. Not that if you fly first class, you're a haughty person, not by any stretch, but this can happen to you. And this plays out in a million different ways in our society. There's a million different ways this can happen to you if you're not careful and you're not intentional to hear what Paul says when he says, do not be haughty. There were some researchers, Keltner and Piff, who did some research in this particular area and they had some very interesting findings. And among them, they sat up shop at a four-way intersection, four stop signs. And they watched what happened at that intersection. And here's what they found, that people who are driving expensive cars, this is relative, of course, people who are driving expensive cars were four times more likely to cut off people who were driving less expensive cars. Doesn't mean you can't drive an expensive car if you're a Christian. Doesn't mean that you're necessarily cutting people off if you do drive an expensive car. But take notice, four times more likely, there seems to be a correlation there. I break the mold. I drive a not nice car and cut people off in intersections. So <laughs> I'm not throwing stones at anyone. I'm just saying we have to take notice here and be careful that this isn't happening to our own hearts. Those same researchers set up shop at, a cross, uh, at, a, at an intersection, a crosswalk, and they walked across the street. And what they found was that people in less expensive cars, as they defined them, let every single one of the pedestrians have the right of way. Those who are driving expensive cars, 46.2% of the time, cut the pedestrian off, even after they'd made eye contact. Again, not saying if you drive an expensive car, you cut off pedestrians, it's saying, well, watch out. Watch out if we have, that, we don't be, that we don't become arrogant and think that other people are less valuable than us because of the difference in our net worth. I can go on and on with these illustrations, actually. There's a ton of studies about this. If you are wealthy, you are statistically more likely to lie or to cheat in the course of a negotiation. A, a study by the um, New York Psychiatric Institute found that wealthy people, this is a survey of 43,000 people found that wealthy people are far more likely to walk out of a store without paying for something than poor people. It's stunning, isn't it? It's staggering. You think to yourself, what in the world is going on? Is this true? Again, not getting down on the wealthy. I'm saying to, to us who are wealthy, it's us, we have to be careful that this isn't happening in our own hearts, that we're not becoming those kind of people who suddenly think we're better than others because of what we possess. We must not be haughty, to be humble, or to put the interests of others and consider them right alongside of, even ahead of our own. The second thing that Christians must do, that rich Christians must not do, is do not set your hope on riches. He says it in verse 17, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches. Why not? Because they're uncertain. Don't set your hope on riches because they're not certain. They, 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 can't, they can't always be there for you. They won't always be there for you. There, there were lots of folks in the dot-com boom who were certain that these riches were going to be with them forever and, and they woke up one day and they're gone. There were lots of folks in the housing bubble who had great riches and perhaps had their, 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 they were, they were, had their hopes set on those things and suddenly they wake up one day and it's gone. 
They experience what the writer of Proverbs says when he says, do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it is gone for suddenly it sprouts wings flying like an eagle toward heaven. Many people have experienced this. They had wealth and it was like it just grew wings one day and flew away and they couldn't catch it. It's like the kid walking with a helium balloon down the street and suddenly it slips through their fingers and you can't get it back. It's just, it just flies away and you watch it as it goes. And if that's where your hope is, you're finished. And of course, that's what happens when we experience major crashes or major bankruptcies and so on is that's a very common time for people to take their own lives. The Bible warns us against setting our hope on riches because no matter how certain they seem and no matter how sure and secure your future feels, it can go in a moment. In fact, it's interesting, maybe one of the great ironies of our culture, which is quite materialistic and where we have a great deal of our hope set on our wealth, that our wealth says on it, in God we trust. It's almost standing there mocking us who have set our hope on wealth that our wealth says, no, don't, don't trust in me. Don't set your hope here, set your hope on him. And so we ought to do, rich Christians, we must be careful not to be haughty and we must be careful not to set our hope on the uncertainty of riches because they can sprout wings and disappear. And then what will you have? What then are rich Christians to do? Well, here's what the Bible says we must do. First of all, set your hope on God. That's the flip side of what he's just said. Verse 17 again, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. In contrast to riches which are uncertain, set your hope on God who is very much certain. He doesn't sprout wings and fly away from you. He's promised that he will be with you even to the end of the age. He's promised that if you set your mind and your heart on seeking first his kingdom, he's going to take care and make sure that you're provided for every single thing that you need. Now, here's one of those areas where poorer Christians have an advantage over more wealthy Christians. If you're 65 years old and you have zero money put away in your retirement account, you run no risk of laying your head down on your pillow and saying, thank God for my 401k. You're not going to do that. You're going to say, dear God, please help me make it another day. They have an advantage. Those who have Now, the Bible doesn't commend not putting the things away and not thinking about the future and so on, but those who have need to be careful that our hope hasn't gone from the Lord who's provided with all these things for us to enjoy to the things themselves. Now, look what it says here about God. It says he richly provides us with everything to enjoy. It's quite common to think of God as being stingy. If you're on the outside looking into Christianity where there's all of these calls and invitations and even commands to be generous, to give, and so on, you might think to yourself that God is stingy. And I wouldn't want to be a Christian because you just have to, it's just like you're giving all the time. But actually what the Bible says is God's actually not stingy at all. In fact, every single thing that you have has been richly provided by him for you to enjoy, including the ability to earn wealth. That's his gift to you. He's not stingy. He's given you these gifts. Think about this. It's God who has given us sunshine. It's God who's given us hot water. It's God who's given us marital bliss. It's God who's given us bacon, for goodness sake. (laughs) He loves you. And he richly provides us with everything to enjoy. And by the way, if he's given you much to enjoy, you don't have to feel guilty about that if you're wealthy. You don't have to feel guilty about that. You could be a rich Christian. You don't have to feel guilty for enjoying what God has given you. Everything is, is, is fine so long as we receive it with thanksgiving, Paul says earlier in this same book. But we need to be careful that our hope hasn't become set on it. And, and, by, and when our hope becomes set on it, what we begin to do is we begin keeping more and more for ourselves and we begin thinking more and more about how this can satisfy the deepest desires of my heart and less and less conscious about the other people that God's placed into our lives whom we are called to be caretakers for. 
What else must rich Christians do? Well, the Bible says they must be rich in good works. Verse 18, they're to do good and to be rich in good works. It's interesting. He tells the rich, you're to be rich in good works. And what's beautiful about this is that it doesn't require any money to be rich in good works. You can be rich and be rich in good works. You can be poor and be rich in good works. And what Paul says to all of us is, be rich in good works and do good. Philip Ryken on this passage says, the first thing God wants from the rich is not their money. What he values most of all is a servant's heart. He gave you that money. That's not the first thing that he wants back from you. He wants your heart. And when he has your heart, he knows that he'll also have your resources and that you'll be eager and willing to hear his direction about where those things are to be used and for what purpose. He wants our hearts. And all of us are called to be rich in good works. Certainly money is a fantastic means by which to do good. We're here in this beautiful worship center because people have used some of the money that God entrusted for them to do good so that we can have this to enjoy. And that can be multiplied in many different ways across this church and across the world. We enjoy many good things because others have been rich in good works and we are called to be those kind of people. Thirdly, the rich are to be generous and ready to share. Verse 18, they're to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Generous and ready to share. You might think, and this is commonly thought, when we don't have very much, we think to ourselves, when I have more, I'll be generous. That is not how it works. You, almost universally, statistically, when people get more, they become less generous. One study of a coalition of nonprofit groups of people who give found that people who made less than $25,000 a year on average gave 4% of their income away. People who made more than $150,000 on average gave away 2.7% of their income. That is, that's realistic. And we've talked about this before. The more we have, we think we'll be more, more, more generous, but actually what happens is the more we have, the more we buy for ourselves that requires more maintenance and it actually reduces the percentage that we're giving even if our final number is higher. We're actually less generous than we used to be when we had less. Not saying this is always the case. I'm saying if we're not intentional and we're not careful and we're not paying attention to this, this will happen to us. So this is why Paul says... These things, don't be haughty, don't set your hope on riches, do good, be generous, be ready to share. And just because you were generous yesterday doesn't mean you're generous today. I was thinking about this this week because of the situation I was in. You see, we all tend to be generous in our appraisal of our generosity, Again, there are studies on this. Across the board, people think they give more than they do. And when they actually see how much they gave, they're almost universally shocked that they didn't give more. Lots of research on this. Well, I think I'm generous, like you might as well. And I, had, I, got, a, I got a cool new toy this week for Christmas. All right, I'm not going to tell you what it is. You'll be jealous, but it's cool. <laughs> and... And it's this great toy, and I, was, I, you know, I immediately began to use it. And as I was enjoying it, and thanking God for this great gift, uh, one of the people who means the most in the world to me asked if they could use it, borrow it, just for maybe an hour or so. And I think my eyes must have gone red in that moment. And, and like Gollum, I was my precious. And, I, and, I, and, I, and you know what I said? No. No, no, you can't. And you know what they said? I thought you'd say that. And it was like for a moment I had a streak of conscience again and I realized, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? That not only would I say no to the sharing of this good gift that I just received, but, but apparently I have a pattern of this kind of thing. 
And my visions of being this generous person is, is just shattered. And so I, you know, I made some lame excuse about why, oh, you probably wouldn't, you know, it's probably not helpful for what you're wanting to do. It probably wouldn't be any good, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and then later I just was like, man, I'm a terrible person. I can't believe that's in me. You know, I thought I was past that sort of thing, past being selfish. And, and I came back around and said, no, really, you can use it. Of course, they're like, I, no, thank you. Because God forbid something should happen to it while it's in their possession when they, when they see what's in my heart, right? And, and of course they didn't want to use it. And I was, I was distressed by that. And I, I can't believe that's in there. And I, maybe, maybe you've got a little bit of that in you too. I'm not saying you do. I'm saying I saw it in me and it surprised me. Maybe it's in you too. You see, maybe it's not. Maybe money, you're open-handed and you're like, I'm happy to let it go. But maybe with your stuff, maybe you're much more like Gollum and me. Or maybe it's your time. I don't share that with anybody. Or maybe it's your care or compassion. Uh, but you see, generous people are just generous. And Paul says, that's the kind of people that we're to be. Generous, ready to share, that we're ready. We're not, it's not like we're avoiding people who might ask us to borrow something. We're ready to do that because we realize it's God who's provided us richly with everything to enjoy. We're happy to, to let that be a blessing to other people. So how do we get there? How does this happen in our heart? Well, the first thing is we've got to, we got to remember the truth of the gospel, what I had forgotten. You see, this gospel impacts everything and our awareness of it. And if we're living in the light of it, at any given moment, it impacts everything. If in that moment, I needed to remember, wait a second, Jesus Christ had all the riches of heaven and he became poor so that I could become rich, incalculably rich in every way. And here I am, the person I love most in the world asked if they could borrow my toy for just a little moment and I couldn't do it. I'd forgotten what's true about who God is. And who I am in him. We've got to remember what's true or else we begin to be very tight-fisted. But there's another thing that can help us here. And that is we can be intentional about the discipline of giving and generosity. Phil Riken says this. One way for us to become more like Christ in our giving is to train ourselves to be generous in the little sacrifices of daily life. Now get ready for some of these. Some of them will, will bother you. Take the small piece of cake. If it's the cake you don't like, that doesn't count. The, the cake that you're excited about. Take the small piece, not because you have to, but just because you just want somebody else to have more. Let someone else have the parking space. Yeah, there's some of us who are just like, I'm not going there. Can't do it. Have to win. Can't. But I'll smile and wave at the person who got the second best space. Leave hot water in the tank for the next shower. Do someone else's chores. Share your power tools with your neighbor. <laughs> you can have my vice grips and my screwdriver, but stay away from my jigsaw. Look to pass the basketball before you shoot. Put a little extra in the offering plate just because you want to. It's for the Christian, generosity ought to be a way of life. It ought to be a way of light. We should be the most generous people on the planet in every way. Because our hope's not in our stuff. And our hope's not even in this world. Our hope's found in Jesus. So, how do we do this? How do we make sure that we are living not for this world. Well, well, Paul says, here's what happens. He says, as you do this, as you're generous, as you're doing good, as you're rich in good works, as you're ready to share, he says in verse 19, by doing so thus, they're storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. He says, when you're generous and you're ready to share and you're giving to people, you're storing up treasure for heaven. Now, this is brilliant what is happening right here. You see, oftentimes in this world, people who are wealthy have gotten wealthy, not always, but oftentimes because they're good business people, because they understand the value of saving and spending less than they, than they make, and they understand good investments, and they put their money in places where it grows and so on. They're good business sense. It's, it's a gift. God's given them. Now, he appeals to the good business sense of these rich Christians and says, 
You're, you know you're only rich in this present age. But by being intentional about how you use those riches now, you can store up for yourselves a treasure that will actually last forever. You see, you can't take anything with you that you have right now, but you can send it ahead or you can take it and you can convert it into something that will be useful when you get where you're going. You can store up for yourselves a treasure in that place. I um, have in my wallet that I carry around, my back pocket typically, a fat stack of cash. And, uh, and I sit on it all the time and I, I should probably take this stuff out. Because what this is, is currency from Egypt, from Libya, from Jordan, from Myanmar, from India. And it's useless here. But I keep it in my wallet. Because I think, well, maybe, you know, maybe I'll use it. But, but people in this country don't value this. This isn't, this isn't valuable here. I could have a, a bunch of handfuls of this and it's still equally valueless in this country. In fact, I've tried to exchange it at multiple different times. Nobody wants this. The smartest thing I could have done was before I left those other countries, was to take and to convert this money into something that would be useful in the place where I was going, namely America. But I held on to it. And now I've got it, and it's good for nothing, save practicing for my next rap video. (laughs) Actually, this is not very much money, it's just a fat stack. Well, what the Bible says is, you're carrying around currency like this right now. And you've been diligent and intentional to save it up and repair, and and that's wonderful, that's great, but here's the, time is running out. And once you've gotten to the land where you're going, you can't convert that anymore. But today, you can convert it into something that's going to last forever. There it will be useful. Today, its value is disappearing quickly. How do we make this conversion from something that's valuable today into something that's going to be valuable, truly valuable forever? Well, in short, you give it away. Jesus said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. The way in which you lay up treasures in heaven is you invest what he's given you into the kingdom of God. So for example, when you give to our mercy ministry fund on the first Sunday of the month, all of that money goes to meet the needs of brothers and sisters in Christ who are in financial difficulty and to people in our community who come to us looking for help. That's where that money goes. That's an investment in the kingdom. That money that you've let go of, you will never lose. You'll never lose it. It is safe for you. When you give to our Faith Promise Pledge for missions, when you give to the ministry of the church, and and not just our church, when you give to ministries that are doing good works in the name of Jesus, and you let stuff go to people in the name of Jesus, when when you're generous and ready to share with what you have for Jesus' sake, That can never be lost. That's an investment that is safe, stored up for you in the heavens. There's not a single thing that will happen to it, and you can be sure, I don't know how, but you can be sure that you will enjoy that in heaven in a way that you could never enjoy it down here. So why aren't we doing more of this kind of conversion? One of my favorite parables in the Bible is found in Luke chapter 16. It's the parable of the dishonest manager. And the basics of the story go like this. There was a really wealthy man, and he hired a manager to handle his estate. Well, the manager wasn't doing a very good job, so the the, the wealthy man said, "Uh, I'm going to fire you. And the manager panicked. He said, I'm too old to dig and I'm too proud to beg, what am I gonna do? 
And so he gets smart. And he provides for himself a cushy landing. This is what he does. He calls in his master's debtors. And he says to one guy, he says, how much do you owe the master? And he says, I owe him a hundred measures of oil. And the manager slips him a piece of paper across the table and he says, quick, write down 50. The guy's like, really? Okay. <laughs> Gets the paper back. Calls in another guy. What do you owe my master? The guy says, I owe him a hundred measures of wheat. Write down 80. 80? Really? Are you sure? Am I on camera? He writes down 80. Well, what's the dishonest manager doing? He's taking the master's money and he's using it to provide for himself a cushy landing when he doesn't have a job anymore. Now, how is the master going to respond to that? He's going to be ticked off, right? No, this is what it says. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, this is Jesus, I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. He's the master. He's entrusted you with his resources. And he's saying to you, I want you to use this to provide yourself a cushy landing. What I've entrusted to you, I, I want you to, to be free with it and to provide for yourself a cushy landing so that on the other side of this thing, you have a warm welcome in heaven. He's inviting you and me to convert what he's entrusted to us that's steadily losing value into something that will be valuable forever, into treasures in heaven. It's an invitation. This is his goodness to you. When we are, when we are, when we are tight-fisted and clutching, again, not only does the Bible say it, there's tons of research to back this up. You will be less happy and satisfied. But people who are generous, whether they're Christians or not, are happier. They're more fulfilled. They feel more secure. The Bible invites us to this, to be these kind of people. Why? Verse 19, he says, that they may take hold of that which is truly life. There's some sense in which if we're grasping tightly to our wealth and the things of this world, there's some real sense in which it can keep us from taking hold of eternal life. And it brings us back around to the story of the rich young ruler and Jesus' invitation to him, which was to let go of that which you're clinging so tightly to that you might have that which is truly life. Well, it brings us to the third piece. What all Christians must do, and that is to guard the deposit. Verse 20. Oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Guard the deposit entrusted to you. He's not talking about money. With money, he says, I want you to be open-handed. And I want you to tell the people to be open-handed. But with the deposit... You cling to that. You guard that with your very life. What's the deposit? The deposit's the gospel. The deposit's the scripture. The deposit's that which has been handed down from the prophets and the apostles to the church through the ages. It's, it's the scripture. Be open-handed, he says, with your stuff. Guard this with your life. He says, because... There is a lot of irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. There's a lot of imitations of the word of God. There's a lot of taking of the word of God and developing it into something other than what it is. So you guard this, the pure word, the unadulterated word. It's not something you create. It's something that was given to you. It's not something the church creates. The church was born of the word, not the word from the church. 
And now the church's responsibility, our responsibility, yours and mine, is to guard the deposit that's been entrusted to us. Leo the Great, some 1,500 years ago, described the deposit this way. He says, it's that which is committed to thee, not that which is invented by thee. It's that which thou hast received, not that which thou hast devised. A thing not of wit, but of learning. Not of private assumption, but of public tradition. A thing brought to thee, not brought of thee, wherein thou must not be an author, but a keeper, not a leader, but a follower. Keep the deposit. That's our call to keep the scriptures, to keep the gospel pure and unadulterated for it's that which is the key to unlocking everything else in this book about life in the household of God. And he closes with these words, grace be with you. God's unmerited favor be with you. The scriptures tell us that we're no longer under the law. We're not under the condemnation of the law. If our faith is in Jesus, we're not under the reign of the law. We're under the reign of grace where we get what we don't deserve. Namely, God sending his own son to bear the cross in our place so that all of the riches of heaven could be unleashed to us, all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places could be unleashed to us who receive them purely on the basis of the empty hands of faith. Just by saying to God, I have not and I desire from you, will you please give me? And he says, gladly. That's the offer of salvation. It's there for everyone who will receive it. And when we have that gift of grace and when we understand that God's grace is with us, well, then it begins to open our hands and we find it, we find their resource to not be haughty because of what we've been given, but to be humbled. We find their resource to, to not look down on other people, to not set our hope on riches because we realize that the, 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 the gifts we have, they're just gifts. Our eyes are on the giver. We find their resource to be generous and ready to share and open-handed because our eyes aren't fixed here. They're fixed beyond. And our aim here is to convert what God has given into something that's going to be useful and glorious forever. Brothers and sisters, it's grace that is the key to life in the household of God. May you know it. May you grow richly in it and deeper in it. And together, by grace, We'll live a life that glorifies him in his household. Would you pray with me? We thank you, Lord, that by your grace, you've counted us worthy to be a part of your church. That you've given us undeserving, the greatest gift of all in giving us Jesus Christ. And that you've told us that If you were so gracious as to give us Jesus, how could we think that you're going to withhold anything good from us? We ask your forgiveness, Lord, that we forget that and that we lose sight of that. I ask your forgiveness the way that I can clutch at the things of this world, forgetting what's true. Pray, Lord, that you would just work within us, each and every one of us, this spirit of generosity that flows when we understand the riches you've given us in Jesus. And Lord, that you would unleash a wave of that through your church, the household of God all around the world. That many may be blessed and hear the good news of Jesus and experience the good news of the kingdom because of the giving of your people. We pray that you would help us to be faithful as a church to guard the deposit that's entrusted to us. That we would be faithful to the gospel. That we'd be faithful to preach it and to live it. And Lord, that you will be faithful to continue to build your church. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.